Good morning, everyone. It is Friday, January the 15th, 2021. It is currently 1118 a.m. Central Time, and I'm here at Victory Baptist Church, Ovalo, Texas. And I, I'm, I don't know how long I'm going to be here today, but I wanted to come out here to address a couple of things. And one of the things we're going to be talking about here, probably in a live broadcast coming up, maybe the next one or the one after, I think I'm going to try to do three today, is we're going to be talking about something that an email listener emailed me and asked me about. And I thought it was, I thought it was a very, I thought it was a very timely email because it really, the question that what, what he asked me to discuss really forces us to look ahead, right? I mean, I know right now we've been looking back. We've been looking right what's right in front of us. But at some point, as Christians and as the church, we do need to look ahead and try to say, what do we need to do and what things are coming our way? What things do we need to be prepared for? And there is one specific issue this the emailer asked me about, and that's what we're going to try to work through. And I've been doing a little bit of research, and, and it looks like it's going to be difficult to try to just get to the bottom of it because there's so many different opinions about it. But it is something that churches are going to have to think about. So I think what we're going to do today is we're just going to kind of talk a lot today about kind of where we are, where we're going how we need to think, what the church needs to do, because right now the world is, uh, well, the world is in a mess right now. It is chaotic. It's crazy. And uh, hopefully, hopefully things don't go as bad as people are fearful of. Right now, if you look uh, to Washington, D.C. and see how many troops are there, it is absolutely crazy to see how many troops are there trying to, to provide security to protect people from well, fellow Americans, that that is the crazy situation and where we are. It just shows how divided the nation is. And the church has to try to navigate through all of this and looking forward to things that are coming our way. And we need to do so, obviously, being spiritually minded, being biblically minded. We need spiritual wisdom. Uh, we've got to think through, uh, through these situations carefully. And there's a lot to consider. So I appreciate the the person sending me the email because it made me stop and go, okay, yeah, I've been so focused on the here and now. I haven't really been looking to, I haven't been looking forward going, okay, what what is coming our way? And we all know that when a new administration takes over and the first 100 days, that's where they really tr start trying to implement their policies, their their agenda, their their view of what they want America to look like and what things that they believe needs to be you know, put into place. And so what we need to look at is what could happen in those first 100 days that could greatly impact the church and Christians and, and how should we prepare for it? So I am thankful for that, but we still have a lot to try to unpack. So this is what we're going to do. On NPR, they uh, aired a report uh, basically kind of asking, you know, where, where does the church go from here? After everything that happened at the Capitol building, everything with President Trump, is the is it time for the evangelical church? Well, I don't know to do a little soul searching to really look to itself. So what, this is what we're going to do. We're going to play the report. I'm going to break in and kind of analyze it. I'll throw out some thoughts, and I'm going to try to do this with looking at where we are, but also looking how can we move forward. There's going to be kind of a theme developing uh, today, and hopefully it will be beneficial. All right. So we're just going to look at a lot of today's going to be looking at a lot of what's going on in the culture, what's going on in the church and what we need to be looking, uh, what we need to be preparing for and trying to look forward and, and trying to figure out how we can move forward as Christians and as the church. So that's what we're going to try to do today and a number of live broadcasts. And hopefully you find all of them to be beneficial and helpful and always be prepared that my perspective will probably go against <laughs> most of modern day Christianity. I, I constantly find myself at odds with modern day Christianity, but there, that's nothing unusual. I've always found myself at odds with a lot of modern day Christianity. But hopefully I can provide you some, some information and some thoughts that will be helpful. So are you ready? Let's go to this NPR report. Um, we're going to listen to it together in real time. I just saw this a little, a few minutes ago, 
And when I saw this, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to grab the audio and we're going to listen to it together. So this is going to be my reaction in real time. Nothing prepared, nothing overproduced, nothing edited, real time. We're going to listen to it together and I'll offer my thoughts. Now, this report, I think, aired a few days ago, but I just came across it. I went, When I got to the church and hooked up my podcasting equipment, I looked over my iPad and looked at a couple of things. I'm like, there, oh, there it is. In fact, let me see if I have the name of this for you. The name of this segment. This aired on NPR Radio. Let me find it here really quick for you. Let me find it here. I was also reading a very interesting article, but we won't we won't get into that. Let's see here. Where is this? Let me go back to my notes. Uh, yeah, I did save it in my notes. Here we go. It's opening up NPR. All right. Uh, this is the title. How did we get here? A call for an evangelical reckoning on Trump. So first, a question. How did we get here? And then kind of a statement a call for an evangelical reckoning on Trump. Well, I think I know how we've gotten got here. I think I know how we have arrived at this moment. And I've been talking about it for years. The church has become politically hijacked. The church looked at the world, was like, the world is messed up. We don't like it. We need to fight it. And we're going to look to a po- politics and a politician and political policies in order to try to, quote unquote, save America. And, and I guess, I don't know, make it Christian again. But you can't do that through policies and politicians and politics. We, we, we basically aligned ourselves trying to use, well, um, a political ally, an arm of the flesh, for us to try to accomplish what we wanted to spiritually, and that never works. That there's That's failure written all over it. That's how we got here. We turned to politics. The church compromised. The church looked to politics instead of the preaching of God's word, evangelism, bringing people into the church through baptism, discipling people. No, that it, we, we, not, not through prayer, not through fasting. It was through politics. And I have been saying this over and over and over. So that's how we got here. We'll see what they have to say. And then a call for an evangelical reckoning on Trump. I don't like it uh, being called a reckoning. It needs to be a time of great repentance. The American church needs to repent for it, uh, for it, uh, for its abandoning, it, it abandoned Christianity. It abandoned biblical principles. It abandoned what we should stand for theologically, and it turned to politics. So we need a repentance more than a reckoning. But that's the that's the name of this segment. How did we get here? A call for an evangelical reckoning on Trump. Let's listen to it. We'll see. Now, it is from NPR, so there's probably some things here we may not agree with, but let's just hear. Let's just listen to it. That's what we need to do. Let's just listen to it and see what they have to say. Because sometimes, sadly, I think I think a lot of what's happened over the last four years, I hate to say this, I think in some cases, the world had a better understanding about what was happening in the church than those in the church had. I think the world were like, what is the church doing? What is Christianity doing? Like, what, 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 what is happening? It's becoming a political movement. What, what is happening? And the church just did not listen. I mean, like, well, they're the world. They don't understand. Well, maybe maybe if, if the world was that confused by what we were doing, maybe that was a bad sign from the start. So I don't know. Let, let's listen to this, and we'll see what they have to say. Here we go. Our next guest says white evangelical Christians need to take their share of responsibility for this precarious moment in American history. The Access Hollywood tapes, immigrant children separated from their parents, the president's incessant lies. Through it all, white evangelicals have, by and large, stood by President Trump. During Trump's presidency, they saw three abortion rights opponents seated on the Supreme Court. But at what cost? Ed Stetzer is the director of the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College. He says after the deadly Capitol Hill riot, white evangelical Christians need a reckoning. You. All right. Now let's stop right here. Um, I do not like the white evangelical Christians, white evangelical Christians. Now I understand that white evangelical Christians were the, where is where Trump found a large portion of his support. It's where he got elected the first time. So I understand they're using that that designation, that demographic to, to say, hey, the, these are the people who did it. I understand that. I'm, I don't care about color of skin. What I care about is Christians. I don't care what color of skin. My issue is Christians. 
Christians supported this. Christians defended things that they should have never defended and, and, and started sounding like that they were a part of the Republican Party and set of, of, of Christianity. And so that's the reckoning we need to come up with. There, yeah, I understand if, if you want to look at it from a voting demographic, white evangelical Christians. I just my thing is I'm not here to get it. it it's not about skin color. It's about people who profess to be believers in Jesus Christ, people who profess to be a part of the same faith that I'm a part of, supporting and defending things that were indefensible, supporting ideas and actions that were just like, no, what is going on? Supporting lies and conspiracy theories, um, which they should have never done, spreading false information, bearing false witness, all of all of these things. And then just allowing their tone of discussion, the words that they were using seemed like that they were not being, they were not coming from the scripture or from, you know, from God. They were coming from um, a political perspective. They were coming from, you know, the Trump Twitter account more than they were coming from the scriptures. That is what should have, should have woken up Christians. Christians should have woken up and said, wait a minute, what are we doing? What are we doing? We're looking at the world from a political perspective, not a theological perspective. And again, the reason the reason the church was so ripe for that is because the church at large had abandoned theology. The church at large had abandoned um, any kind of meaningful, in-depth teaching of the Word of God. And once people are no no longer theologically minded, well, then they are vulnerable to their, their thinking, they're going to, they're going to, if they don't have a theological perspective, they're going to have some kind of perspective. And while well, they chose a political perspective is, is, well, how we got here. All right, but let's, let's continue. Right. That quote, many evangelicals are seeing Donald Trump for who he is. Do you really think that's true? I mean, there've been so many other things Trump has said and done over the past four to five years that betray Christian values and their support didn't waver. You think this time it's different? Yeah, I think it's a fair question. And I've been one for years who was saying we need to see more clearly who Donald Trump is and has often not been listened to. But I would say that for many people, the uh, storming of the Capitol, the desecration of our you know halls of democracy has shocked and stunned a lot of people and uh, how President Trump is engaged in you know, riling up crowds to accomplish these things. Yeah, I, I do think so. Now, I think there's some significant and important conversations that we need to have inside evangelicalism, asking the question, what happened? Why were so many people drawn to somebody who was obviously so not connected to what evangelicals believe by his life or his practices or more? You write that Trump has burned down the Republican Party. Let's let's talk about this. What has he done to the evangelical Christian movement, do you think? Yeah, and that's my greater concern, too. You know, he's burned down the Republican Party, emboldened white supremacists, mainstream conspiracy theories. But for me, you know, as my particular concern as an evangelical, as someone who's really committed to evangelical beliefs about the gospel and sharing Christ and more, to see how evangelicals have rallied in some cases, not everybody, but in some cases, regardless of what the president could do, there were evangelical enablers and there were evangelical participants. And I think ultimately that's not what we're supposed to be about. If you if you ask today what's an evangelical to most people, I, I would want them to say someone who believes Jesus died on the cross for our sin and in our place, and we're supposed to tell everyone about it. But for most people, they'd say, oh, those are those people who are really super supportive of the president, no matter what he does. And I don't think that's what we want to be known for. That's certainly not what. Okay. Now, this is so frustrating. It's, it's, it's so frustrating to be someone who's been talking about this for so long and, and then hear people after the fact going, okay, this, these are some things we need to consider. Now, he's also one who has been speaking about this for a long time as well. But let's, let's take a couple of things apart. First, we, we've got to realize the way he said we need to have a discussion, basically, of how we got here. I, I've already articulated how we got here. The church looked at the world and we're like, this is a mess. What are we going to do? And instead of looking at, uh, at biblical solutions, they turned to politics. That's how we got here. That's the problem. And whenever you would say, well, wait, wait a minute, Trump this and Trump this and, and this is not biblical. Yeah, yeah, but, but he's trying to fight for the things that matter. Yeah, but you want to fight for things that matter in an unbiblical way. And it, it's like trying to talk to Christians about it was like trying to talk to a, the wall that's right here next to me. It's like it, it, you're not getting anywhere because it's like they're just looking at you like they don't understand, which was always frightening. I'm like, how do you not understand? We look at this from a theological perspective. 
the solutions you want implemented to so-called save the country are not going to save the country because the problems are spiritual and can only be resolved spiritually. That is through the proclamation of Christ and the gospel and salvation. But people did not listen. But I, I, I think I think this is very, very important, very important to, to try to to try to think about and wrap our minds around. Um, when when the world starts seeing us as Trump supporters first and followers of Christ second, that should be a warning sign that we have completely lost the plot, lost the narrative, and we messed up. And that's what the world started looking at. Oh, those evangelical Christians, Trump supporters. No, 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 no. And I don't know how many times I had to say, look, no, I'm a Christian, but no, I am not a Trump supporter. I don't. But here's what I think is going to happen. This is what is happening. All right, now listen carefully. So so a couple of things. This is very important. Number one, this this I, I'm going to try to um, make my own argument here. Number one, the first thing we need to remember is this is a lesson about trying to con- basically convert the world over to a Christian worldview through the use of political force. Never works, never happens, and it usually just creates hostility against you. But the bottom line is you cannot change the, the heart, and, and Christianity says the heart is depraved, and the only hope is salvation. All right, so I hope if we're going to have a reckoning, we need to get back. Listen, here's the reckoning we need. Here's the repentance we need. We need to repent of our, the American Christianity needs to repent of its very flawed view of human depravity and get back to an, a, a correct understanding of human depravity and applying that doctrine to the world's problems. The problem is depravity. The solution is the gospel. That I cannot stress that enough, right? Number two, whenever you realize you're becoming more identified for your political beliefs and not your theological beliefs, that is a sign that you're not being a witness of Christ. What, what many Christians took to social media to do was to be a witness for Trump, to be a witness for conservative politics, well, that goes against the Great Commission. You're to go and preach Christ, not go and preach your politics. But the church lost the plot. And, well, that's, that's, that's where we are. But here, here's what I think is happening. What has happened and what is only becoming more and more clear is this. The church is about, I, I think you can almost see this. There is almost a church split. Now, when I say a church split, Now, I'm not speaking of an individual congregation, even though it may split individual congregations. I'm saying that there's going to become a split within the evangelical world. And this is something we're going to have to consider moving forward. There's going to be a split, and the split is going to go this way. Basically, if you are still not a Trump supporter, you still you don't believe the election was stolen. You don't believe COVID was is a hoax. If if you don't if you don't you know basically continue to support Trump. And if you, uh, if, you, if you don't do those things, then you're going to have to go somewhere else. You're not welcomed. You're not, because there's almost, almost going to become this division within Christianity, this split, and it's going to come up, uh, it's going to be based off your political affiliation, your political ideology. And it's going to involve Trump, the election, whether it was stolen or not stolen, and COVID basically being a hoax and overblown, and it's not really that serious. Really, that's what that's where we are. And if you if, and, and, and I've seen I don't know how many articles and posts and different things that Christians have said that basically say, look, if you don't if, if, if you if you're going to be over here and, and somehow go against Trump, then you are a baby killing Satanist who hates God. And it's like, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What what? Why are you doing this? We've got. Listen, the church is in dire trouble. Right. He talked about Trump basically burning down the Republican Party. I think Trump has done irreversible damage to American Christianity. And and I don't blame Trump. I blame the church because the church never have, should have gotten so involved in politics. It should, we should have been so removed from all of this that we were not involved. That when the world was out there, you know, yelling and screaming and fighting, that someone could have said, where can we turn to get away from all of this? And the church would have been like right here. We're not going to sit there and talk about that. We're going to talk about Christ and him crucified. That's what we are about. But the church, the church is there. And so now the division, the division in the culture is the division in the church. 
That means we're no different than the world. The, the political division that's in the culture is the political division now in the culture of the church. And that is something we ha- are going to have to reckon with. And I don't know how we get past it. Everyone's got to renounce their political affiliation. And, and re- 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 I think this is what we almost have to do. Christians need to renounce their political affiliations and confess their loyalty to Christ. We almost need a national day, a national day, not a national day, a day of repentance for the for Christians. And we renounce our political ideologies. We renounce them. We, we, we take off the, the Make America Great hat again. Get rid of the Trump flag. Get rid of your, your left progressive leanings. We got to just throw all of that down and say, let's get back to scripture, doctrine, theology, church history, uh, discipleship, evangelism, the Lord's Supper, baptism. Let's get back to that. But I, it's not, your, your Christianity is now almost defined not by your theological belief system, but your political belief system. It's like if you don't believe, if you don't believe uh, that, you know, the election was stolen, COVID is a hoax, and, and, and you still don't support Trump, or that the uh, attack on the Capitol building was some grand conspiracy as well. Basically, if you don't buy into conspiracies, a pro-Trump conspiratorial mindset, then your Christianity is called into question. And sadly, you can find those who are so far on the left that if you have any support for Trump, then you're not a Christian either. And it's like we've got to get, we've got to, we are using categories to divide Christians that are not even biblical categories, right? We, I, this, this is a major, major problem here. There's a major, major problem here, right? Let's, let's back this up just a little bit. Let's back this up just a little bit. Right, here we go about. If you, if you ask today what's an evangelical to most people, I, I would want them to say someone who believes Jesus died on the cross for our sin and in our place, and we're supposed to tell everyone about it. But for most people, they'd say, oh, those are those people who are really super supportive of the president, no matter what he does. And I don't think that's what we want to be known for. That's certainly not what I want to be known for. And I think as this presidency is ending in tatters as it is, Hopefully, more and more evangelicals will say, you know, we should have seen earlier, we should have known better, we should have honored the Lord more in our actions these last four years. As you have indicated, you've been critical of Donald Trump from the very beginning, but you are in conversation on a regular basis with people, I assume, for whom Donald Trump represented a champion in the White House for evangelical yeah. causes. Can you explain how evangelicals convinced themselves that character didn't matter when it came to Donald Trump? Yeah, and that's literally what happened. They changed their minds, and it happened between the Clinton administration, or President Bill Clinton, and there's actually a poll. I wrote about this years ago, and the poll said that white evangelicals at one point were the highest group of people who said that the private morality of public figures is essential. It's important. The highest number. And then in and around the 2016 campaign, they became the group of people who held that at the lowest number. And to change your view of morality in order to elect a presidential candidate, I think, is the definition of selling out your beliefs. And so I think we'd have to just be honest. A big part of this evangelical reckoning is is a lot of people sold out their beliefs. I do think there's a time and a place that people said, you know— uh, I'm not voting for a person or or there are things that he supports that I support. I really struggled. It's, you know, the lesser of two evils arguments. I think there are good people who get into a voting booth who make difficult decisions that may have made difficult decisions or different decisions than you and than I uh, would have made. But at the end of the day, when you change your view of morality in order to make that decision, you're doing it in a way that undermines the very beliefs that should be the foundation of your life. So what does the reckoning look like? Do evangelicals, in your opinion, need to untether themselves from the Republican Party? I think evangelicals need to untether themselves from people who have consistently shown who they are. When people show you who they are, believe them. I think evangelicals need to untether themselves from conspiracy theories like QAnon and others that really, as you watch some of the things that took place on the Capitol building, there was a distinctly religious overtone in some of those things. And not not everyone who was there for uh, a march uh, protesting what, what, a, what is kind of an untrue you know, assertion that the election was stolen, but not everyone rushed the Capitol either. But there's too many people 
who named the name of Jesus or who carried a flag with Jesus' name on it that participated in wrong, sinful actions. And I think we need to ask the question. Part of this reckoning is, how did we get here? How were we so easily fooled by conspiracy theories? Why are religious people disproportionately engaged in QAnon? Why does QAnon's language sound like religious language, which thus makes it appealing to religious people? Those are the kind of things that I think a reckoning needs to come. People need to ask hard questions. We need to get back to who we are, which not everyone who listens is going to value and appreciate who evangelicals are, what they believe about God and the Bible and Christian living in the world. But we need to make clear who we are and our allegiances to King Jesus, not to what boasting political leader might come next. Do you think that needs to happen from the pulpit? I mean, you talk about people needing to disavow themselves of conspiracy theories. I mean, should should ministers on Sunday mornings be delivering messages about how to sort fact from fiction and discouraging their parishioners from seeking truth in these darkest corners of the internet peddling lies? Absolutely, absolutely. Mark Knoll wrote years ago a book called The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind, and he was talking about the lack of intellectual engagement in some corners of evangelicalism. I think the scandal of the evangelical mind today is the gullibility that so many have been brought into conspiracy theories, false reports, and more. And so I think the Christian responsibility is we need to engage in what we call in the Christian tradition discipleship. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? So Jesus literally identifies himself as the truth. Therefore, if there ever should be a people who care about the truth, it should be people who call themselves followers of Jesus. But we have failed, and I think pulpits and colleges and universities and parachurch ministries and more need to ask the question, how are we going to disciple our people so that they engage the world around them in robust and Christ-like ways? And I think part of the evangelical reckoning is we haven't done that well. Ed Stetzer leads the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. Thanks for your time. Thank you. All right. So much of what he says there, it's not that I disagree. It's just so frustrating to hear because why wasn't the church listening for too many people who were screaming, hey, the church needs to get back to discipleship. The church needs to get back to thinking. The church needs to avoid conspiracy theories. But sadly, these conspiracy theories even entered into areas of Christianity where you would have pastors who were known for exegetical preaching and doctrine and theology. And next thing you know, they're standing behind the pulpit throwing out QAnon conspiracy theories about COVID. And you're like, what has happened? Why are Christians, this is a very important question, why are Christians so gullible to conspiracy theories? I don't get it. The the faith that says there is truth, Absolute truth. Truth is not relative. The, the, the faith that says do not bear false witness, do not speak lies, that's the faith that finds itself filled with people who appear to be more gullible to buying into lies and then sharing those lies on social media. It is an embarrassment. It is an embarrassment to the name of Christ. It's an embarrassment to Christianity. And Christians should be ashamed of themselves. They, they should just absolutely be ashamed of themselves. But there's no, it, there seems to be no repentance, no remorse, no brokenness. You just, they just keep hopping on social media. Here's another lie. Here's another social, here's another conspiracy theory. Blah, 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 blah. You know, just throw out lie after lie after lie after lie. Broken logic after, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how broken the logic is. Christians just keep doing it. So I would like to believe that the solution is, is discipleship. It is, I guess that, that's a solution if discipleship involves trying to teach Christians how to think. But here's the thing. You can't teach Christians how to think if the person standing behind the pulpit is the one who's promoting the conspiracy theories. I, I, I don't, why are so people gullible to it? Why are people so gullible to it? I do not know. I don't don't know how people cannot understand how to process information, but I've seen it. You'll just have Christians just, and you're like, what are you talking about? And and sometimes, you know, you'll hear it even, you know, you know, after a sermon where people are just talking, getting ready to leave church, you'll hear someone in in the congregation say something. You're like, oh, wait a minute. Okay. Let me write. And then you go home and do, 
you know, I'm tap, tapping on my iPad, you know, a couple of seconds of searching, you're like false, 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 false. And then you think, what do you do? What do you do? Like, I, do you stand behind the pulpit and go, hey, I know some of you are spreading this garbage. Stop spreading it. Like, like you can't just like there's a time to fight. And then there's a time you like, you know, how what do you do? And I think all you can do is you've got to use every I think pastors have to use every everything at their disposal. Right. Every everything we have, every form of technology to try to confront it. And to try to speak against it, I, I try to use my podcast for it far more than I use the pulpit. I try my best to use use the all my podcasts and, and to hope my, my the members of my church are listening to try to get them away from all of that. I've been warning my church about QAnon. I don't even know how long I've been warning my church about QAnon. For it seems like forever. I, I don't know how long I've been talking about QAnon, and it. I I don't know. I, I hope they listened. I hope. I hope they did. Um, but I and and I don't pay I don't follow them on social media. I don't I don't want to see what <laughs> I don't want to see. I don't want to see what my church members are posting on social media. I don't uh, be, because at some point you can't you've got to let people live their lives as well. Like you can't turn the church into a uh, dictatorship where you are monitoring everyone's words and then trying to use their words, you know, to then determine what you're going to address from the pulpit. You got to be careful with that as well, because that's, that's dangerous, right? So then, because then people will just then not follow you, block you, and then they'll post whatever they want. And you don't, you don't want that. You've got to, you got to allow Christians to try to figure it out, to struggle, to fall. Now, when you clearly know that they're promoting something false, and sometimes you got to call them aside and say, what are you doing? You can't do that. But I think without addressing specifics, you got to constantly be challenging your people to think, to think. And you got to be constantly warning your people, don't be sharing false information. Don't be bearing false witness. That is scripturally, that is scripturally condemned. You cannot do that. So before you share it, make sure it's factual. And if you don't, and if you, just because you think it's factual, doesn't make it factual, you got to verify, verify, verify. And you don't verify it by only looking for information that agrees with you. You got to listen to all different perspectives. And then you've got to go, what are the facts? What can be proven? What can't be proven? And you've got to be very careful. But here's the bottom line. It seems like Christians want to share that kind of information far more than they want to share about Christ. And that, that's the telltale sign because the, the church has become so preoccupied with conspiracy theories and so preoccupied with politics that, it, that it's almost left Christ. It's left his word. And they only want to use scripture to, to rip a scripture out of context to support their political ideology. And it's like, we're, we know we've got to get back to being biblically minded. It, it's, it's a dangerous time. And, 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 and everyone, I do, I do admire, or at least I'm happy they had the conversation, but he doesn't really have any good answers because, again, part of me would say yes, and I even said it earlier in this episode, that the solution is doctrine, theology, and, and that is if you can get people back to it, but it's no, but it's no guarantee to protect people because, again, there are Christians who there was a time you would have looked to them to be logical and thoughtful and biblical and careful. We've, we've even examined audio from some of these ministries that you would have thought, thought, you know, five years ago, three years ago, man, they would never fall for this kind of nonsense. And then today they, they seem to be dedicated to the nonsense. And you're like, what happened? What, where, what, what occurred? Where, 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 where did you, how did you go off the rails? It, it is, it just shows you how the it just shows you how the um culture can infiltrate the church and and we 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 shouldn't be shocked by that it was that that was what was happening in Corinth when you read the uh, Paul's letter to the ch- uh, church at Corinth the church was acting like the city it had been infiltrated by the city the city was influencing the church more than the church was influencing the city and all of the issues going on in the city were happening inside the church and he was try he had to constantly try to combat this and fight it we're we're experiencing the same thing we've got a culture that is moving further and further away from biblical 
a biblical worldview, and that lack of a biblical worldview is now inside the pew. And, and it's inside the church. And the church has got, but the church, the, I think that, and this is another thing the church really made a mistake about. The church became so preoccupied with the condition of the world that it wasn't looking at the condition of the pew. It wasn't looking, at, we were not looking to the house of the Lord first. We were looking at the world and go, the world's messed up. We need to fix that. Let's turn to politics. Well, in the meantime, the church was in a bad place spiritually. Look, we were spiritually vulnerable to being hijacked. We had let our guard down. We, 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 we became, became politically minded and, and, it, and it happened maybe in a subtle way. But the, the next thing we know, the next thing we know, the, the politician is driving the plane. Next thing you know, the, 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 high, the hijacker had gained access to the cockpit. The next thing you know, the plane's going in a different direction and we're not going in the direction of the Great Commission. We're not going in the direction to equip saints. We're not going in the direction of, 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 of caring about our first love. No, we were, we, the next thing you know, we were going in a completely different direction. And by the time the plane landed, we, I mean, we ended up in a completely foreign country so far removed from biblical Christianity, but everyone got off the plane going, this is a victory for us. This is a victory for Jesus. And Jesus, you know, wants this to be done. And it's like, we are so far. And the world sat back and go, what happened to Christianity? And when the world starts going, what's happening to Christianity? That's a bad sign to Christians. You're like, wait, wait. No, 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 no. You misunderstand. I don't want you to see me as a Trump supporter. I don't want you to see me as a Republican. I don't want you to see me, quote unquote, as a conservative. I want you to see me as a follower of Christ. I want you to see me a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what I want you to see. That there needs to be a time of reckoning. There, there needs. And I know I'm just throwing out a lot of thoughts here. I know I'm just throwing out a lot of thoughts. But there are a lot of issues we have to consider. Yeah, we can figure out how we got here. I think, how do we move forward? How do we move forward? And, I, and I, again, I, I think the two, I think, I think the, three, the three steps to moving forward is we've got to renounce all of our political affiliation. We have to renounce it. We just got to repent of it. We turn to politics, Lord, instead of turning to you. We relied on the arm of the flesh, just like Israel getting in trouble with trying to make an alliance with Egypt and uh, Assyria. And you read about it in Jeremiah, they, they, they get in big trouble for that. We were not supposed to make an alliance with, the, with the, worldly, the worldly world of politics in order to try to accomplish our spiritual goals. All it did was corrupt us. We've got to renounce it. And, and, and too many Christians are unwilling to do so. They're still going down swinging for Trump. They're more worried about Trump than they are about theology, the Bible, and the state of Christianity. Now, they'll say they're fighting a spiritual war, but they're trying to fight a spiritual war through with political means, and that is just frightening. So we've got, I think that's the first step forward. There's got to be a complete renunciation of politics, a complete repentance, renouncing of it, and a sense taking all of your political merchandise and burning it, all right? We talk, we talk about, you know, uh, people in Acts burning things that, w- that were, you know, part of their previous life. There needs to be a, a bonfire of all of our political gar- uh, merchandise and burn it and say, we're not, we're not, we're not in, in the world of politics. Don't, pol- politicians don't look to us anymore. We're not, we're not, don't use us. We're not the tool for you to get power. We're the church of Jesus Christ. We're here to serve Christ. I think that, that has to happen. There's got to be a renouncing. Of it. Number two, there's got to be a full-blown condemnation of conspiracy theories and conspiracy thinking. There's got to be. There's got to be a, a, a renouncing of that. And we've got to teach, we've got to teach people how to think, how to verify sources, uh, uh, laws of logic. We've got, we've got to get, I, I don't, I mean, we've, we almost need, I hate to say it, we almost need Sunday school classes now that deal with how to verify when something is true, how to verify when something is false. Here are the laws of logic. Here are, here are logical fallacies. And we almost had to get back to teaching like basic critical thinking skills 101. And that, that's, and I, and it's really, I, I, I wouldn't say, I, one side, I don't want to say that because it's really not the job of the church, but in some ways, maybe now it's part of Christian discipleship. We've got, look, we've got to, rena- we've got to just renounce and get, and completely get rid of all of our political affiliations. And number two, we've got to build 
disciple Christians to not to be people who can think by, and we got to condemn conspiratorial thinking. We've got to. QAnon cannot, does not have a place in the Christian church. It doesn't. We've got to speak against it. It's got to be spoken again. No, that's not tolerated. Now, sadly, you're just, what you're going to have is a split within Christianity. You're just going to have basically QAnon affiliated Christians running around with all their conspiracy theories. And they're going to, they're going to get their, their truth from, I guess, you know, Alex Jones and, and other conspiratorial minded, uh, you know, podcasters. They're going to get their, their marching orders from that and not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John while they yet rip scripture out of context to support their conspiracy theories. But the church has got to renounce its political affiliation. It's got to stand strong against conspiratorial thinking. It's got to. And then number three, the church has to return, has to return to a biblical worldview, spiritually minded. What is the church called to do? Nowhere is it called to be political. Nowhere does it call call for any political solution. It's called for the preaching of the gospel. Go forth and make disciples. Teach Baptize, teach, prayer, fasting. That's what we've got to get back. We've got to become spiritually minded and get rid of all of this other stuff. We've got to renounce our political affiliations. We have to condemn conspiratorial thinking and try to get people away from it by helping them think correctly. And number three, we've got to get back to a biblical worldview. We have to, we have to. There needs to be a reckoning. But let me tell you, my, my prediction is, is that we're not going to get a reckoning like this. It's not going to be widespread. We're going to end up with a split. Christianity is going to split now. And you're going to have the politically conspiratorial minded Christian. And then you're going to have Christian. Sadly, you're going to have, the. I think this is what you're going to have. You're going to have the politically minded conspiratorial Christian on the right. And you're going to have the politically minded, maybe conspiratorial thinking Christian on the left. And it's going to split into two factions and there's going to be some of us who's going to be left without a home. I, I, I think there's going to be some of us left like we're, we're going to be strangers. We're going to be, I, I, I don't want to say this. I'm not saying this in a prideful way, but I think there's going to have to be a remnant. There's going to be a remnant of people who are not going to be welcomed in the left leaning form of Christianity and the right conspiratorial form of Christianity. I think, I think we're going to be thrown out of both. And, and, and I think, I, 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 I don't, and, and the name on the church building is, is, is now irrelevant. We're, we're not going to be known, Christians are no longer going to be known for their theological perspectives, but their political conspiratorial mindedness, that's where they're going to be known for. And that's going to be seen on the name of the building. So when you go to a church, you'll, it, it's, you can't just ask what your theology is. You're going to have to listen to see how, what, you know, can, are you allowed there if you don't go along with their po- politics and their conspiracies? And I'm telling you, you're not going to be allowed. You, you may, they may let you through the door, but you're not going to feel welcome there because you're basically going to be viewed as you're a heretic. And I believe we're going to end up, end up, I don't know how many churches, how, how many churches are going to be infiltrated with this. I think a lot of people are going to sit there and say, my church hasn't been infiltrated. My church, ha- no, we don't do that. You need to really start talking to the people and listen to them. Listen to what they're saying. Hear those conspiratorial mindedness. Hear their, their, their theories. Hear their political mind, mindedness. And when you start hearing that, think about, well, if, if someone came into this church who didn't go along with those conspiracies and didn't go with all that politics, how would they be treated? I, I really believe we have a split coming. It's going to be, and I believe we're going to end up with three, I think three basic groups, left-leaning Far left leaning. Again, you can go to uh, when I went to Boston, and then I went to uh, Salem uh, to 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 look at uh, the, the witch museum and all the things that happened in Salem with the witch trials and everything that happened there. Okay, I after going through there, as we were driving through Salem and coming back from Salem to, back towards Boston, we passed a lot of churches, a lot of churches. And remember, that was you know the Puritan stronghold in some of those areas, right? Okay, and. You drive past churches and in front of churches were, you know, uh, LGBTQ flags, Black Lives Matter flags. And it's like, clearly those churches are very left leaning uh, from, from uh, a, but they're, they've been politically hijacked. They're on the left. Well, I wouldn't feel welcomed in many of those churches. All right. Well, guess what? You come here to Texas, 
You've got churches that are, boom, you know, pro-Trump, pro-QAnon, basically a patriot-type church. You know, they're going to have the American flag everywhere. They're going to do patriotic-type services, and and they're going to be talking about things from a very conservative political point of view, where there's going to be people who don't feel welcome. I don't feel welcome there either. So if I I don't feel welcomed in the left-leaning church and I don't feel welcomed in the right-leaning church, then where is church for someone like me? Nowhere. (laughs) Okay, And I think a lot of people feel the same way right now. There's going to be a remnant, a a small remnant of of what I believe is to be biblically-minded Christians. And what Christians are going to have to do, you're going to have to wake up and be honest with what's going on in your church. You can tell yourself, oh, no, 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 no. We're not politically minded. No, we're biblically minded. You just keep telling yourself that. Okay, you better wake up and see what's going on. I I believe that's, I think we're going to end up with three streams. Left, right, and then there's going to be this remnant in the middle. And they're not going to be welcomed in either. And I've already seen that. If you don't go for Trump, you're you're you 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 are a baby killer. I'm a baby killer. What, 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 how did I kill babies? What did I do? What did I do? Because you don't care about abortion, or maybe I do care about abortion, but I just don't think that uh, compromising certain Christian principles to try to accomplish that is the way to do it. I think the way to try to overcome that is I don't know Christianity, the gospel, salvation, regeneration. That's the way we fix the world. Nowhere. Did Jesus say, hey, the world, this, 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 this society is supporting some very evil practices. We need to, we need to get the right people in political office. No, he said, go and preach. That's always been the biblical mindset. So I don't know. There, there's just some thoughts, just thinking out loud. Uh, usually what happens is I throw something out this, I, I turn on the microphone and share something like this. And then later I come back and try to organize it a little bit better. But if you've listen, been listening to me for the last few years, this is just a continuation of a lot of things I've been saying. I can remember, I don't remember how long ago telling you, I just think something's wrong within Christianity. There's something not right within Christianity. And well, yeah, there was something not right spiritually. And the spiritual deadness gave way to the political craziness. And that's where we are. We need a spiritual revival. A spiritual revival, not in the country. We need a spiritual revival in the church. That's where revival is to take place. Reviving something, reviving something. The, the world needs a, a spiritual resurrection. They didn't need, need to be brought back from spiritual death into life. The church needs to be resur- uh, not resurrected. They need to be revived because of, the, of our spiritual apathy, lethargy, deadness, because we have our passion. It, we, we've left our first love. The American church is in serious trouble. I'm telling you, it is split left and right. Not left and right theologically, left and right politically. Well, once that happens, both sides are are broken. Where is the biblical-minded Christian? We've got a problem, and Christians are going to have to wake up. You can give me your thoughts. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. All right, everyone have a great day. God bless.